Chapter 10 Arriving home earlier than she anticipated, Alex decided to update her resume and send out a few applications online. She had joined LinkedIn, but then decided against it. She didn't want him to have a paper trail on her. An email came in, and she looked and saw it was from Blackstone's company. There is nothing wrong with opening it, she thought. Alex. I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? I can't sleep without you. You're making me crazy. Max. She was excited that he emailed her. She didn't want to have to worry about whom he was thinking about. She knew his sexual appetite. It was enormous. Mr. Blackstone. You have embarrassed me. What are you going to do next? Alex. Alex. I wouldn't do anything to hurt my beautiful, sexy girl. I need you tonight. Max. Can I trust him? She questioned. She needed to be with him and know that he loved her and that he wouldn't take their son if she didn't agree with him. She needed to know that he still desired her, and most of all, she needed to be in his arms and feel him inside of her. Alex. I'm waiting for your answer. We will discuss our son. Max. Max. I'll see you, but for only an hour. Then you have to leave. Alex. I'll be there in a minute. Max. Alex walked to the restroom to freshen up when the bell rang. How could it be Max that soon? He must have been sitting in his limo, emailing her. She scampered to the door, and not bothering to look through the peephole, she opened the door wide. Blake, you shouldn't be here. Max is coming over. I wanted to make sure you were safe. I didn't see a light, and... He will be over any minute, and it will not look good for me if you are leaving my house. I'm leaving now. Don't trust him, Alex. There is still a dead woman. Please go now. And she pushed him out of the door and closed it. Blake stood on the porch for a few minutes until he saw Max's limo cruise up and stopped at the small bungalow. He walked past the car, turning he spied Max exit the car and look in his direction. Blake got the reaction he wanted. He could see the anger in Max's face. Max raised his finger and rang the bell. Alex opened the door and met Max's gaze. Come in. A silent Max entered and looked around. Alex crossed her arms and turned her back. He followed her through the foyer and to the living area. The house was furnished in fifties decor. There was an old, worn brown couch and two giant wooden lamps with white shades covering the bulbs bracketed it. Alex saw Max's face. I know, but this is the best I can do. I just got a job at a restaurant. I sent my resume out all over town, and I haven't heard from anyone else yet. But I know I will get a call very soon. Are you planning on raising my son in an environment like this, Alex? Max's brow furrowed, and lines of anger deepened his face. It's all I can afford. My parents are going to help me, and when I have to work, they will babysit. He's staying with them until I can get his room together. And when will that be? I can pay for everything you need. Arrange for better living conditions. Move you into my penthouse, build you a house, or if you prefer, you and my boy can have my home in Montana. I don't know. All I need is my son, and you're threatening to separate us. You have been separated from him for a year. I was busy concentrating on his father, hoping that I could make you see me as I am, 
and not the sex-hungry slut you seem to be attracted to. I want you and my son. I don't want just him. Can't you see, Alex? His brow smoothed and his eyes softened. He stepped closer to her, and her resolve weakened. They stared long at each other, but the stillness was broken when Max reached for Alex with both hands and held her face. He leaned close, his lips met hers, and his tongue entered with ease as if it was made for her mouth. The kiss was wet and hot. His lips covered her mouth. Pushing her against the wall with his hands and his hard body, Max sank to his knees and he began lifting her skirt. Then anxiously he ripped her skirt off and threw it to the floor. She watched his head move as he placed kisses on her stomach. His hands were under her bra, and he lifted it over her breasts. Her nipples stood hard and erect. His fingers caressed her nipples. Max eased his hands between her legs and pulled her thong to the side. His mouth cupped her mound. His tongue found her clit. And his fingers pried open her folds. His moaning became louder and louder. I need this, he said, glancing up at her. Tell me you will never allow another man to kiss you like this. As he begged Alex, he pulled her thong down and she stepped out of it. Alex's head fell back and she quietly moaned, No one will ever have me but you. Don't stop, Max, don't stop loving me. She felt his curly locks and weaved her hands through his hair, and with a fistful of hair she pulled hard as he buried his head deep into her mound. His tongue measured each vibration of her clit, knowing that she was on the verge of an orgasm. He intermittently glanced up at her face, knowing that she was in the throes of a long-awaited orgasm. Alex's head leaned far back against the wall and she shouted, Max, I'm coming. She finally admitted that she was in the sub-position when she asked his permission to have her orgasm. He was that strong a force in her sexual life. Max knew now that Alex had become what he wanted, and his need to dominate her was finally realized. You may come, Max said, gazing up at the tortured look on Alex's face. And then there was a calm that washed over her like the eye of a hurricane. I want you to come once more. And he buried his face deep beneath her legs and placed one finger in her vagina and one in her anus with his tongue on her clit. This is wonderful. I'm coming again, she admitted. Max pulled his finger out of her anus and circled the rim of her anus, and a convulsion of orgasms occurred. With her back to the wall, Alex gasped for breath. Her knees wobbled, and Max caught her in his arms, lifted her, and brought her to the bed. He lay her down, and he disrobed. Alex, turn on your stomach. Alex followed his directions. She lay still as Max massaged her back. Her eyes closed as his hands rubbed the nape of her neck and down to her back, and then with both hands he massaged her buttocks. She did not remember when she last felt so serene. She had wanted this day to come, and she fell under his spell once more. Then he leaned forward and trailed his mouth down her back to her buttocks. He nipped each buttock one at a time. A moment of silence occurred. What is it, Max? I can't do this. What do you mean? What the fuck is he talking about? Is he doing this to fuck with my head? I'm not seeing you as my sexual partner. I'm seeing you as the mother of my child. And what does that mean? I thought that this is what he wanted. Now I know what he is looking for. He wants someone like Rebecca, no ties and no children. It means that I can't satisfy my sexual fantasies with you any longer. Then with whom are you going to fuck, suck, and paddle? What the fuck am I thinking? Better yet, what am I doing? Alex sat up in bed, resting on the wrought iron headboard. You must be kidding me, Max. You introduced me to this lifestyle of yours, 
and I accepted everything about it, and now you tell me that because I have your child, we can no longer make love to each other the way you have indoctrinated me. No. I, I'm unable to be turned on the way I once was by you. What does that mean for our relationship? What does this mean for us? A long silence passed between them. Alex could not believe that she had run away from him, only to allow him to get close to her and reject her. Her body ached with the want of his body next to her and the pleasure they'd had between them, the spankings and oral sex that went on and on day and night. Was he that sick that he couldn't have sex with her unless she was that sexy dominatrix, Rebecca? Well, Alex decided that she would not play his games anymore, not another day. I'm not sure, Alex. I have to leave. Alex watched as Max dressed in silence. Then he leaned in to kiss her, and she pulled away. Her handsome lover, whom she had been satisfying and longing for, didn't find her appealing. How fucked up can this be, she thought. Where is Joshua when I need him? What brings you in so soon, Mr. Blackstone? I'm having problems functioning sexually. On your last visit, you appeared to have a sexual life to be envied. You had a problem sleeping, but you have that under control. What is going on now? The woman I'm in love with and the mother of my child. Did you say she had a child for you? You never mentioned that. Yes. I found out about a month ago. That could be your problem. A man becomes a father, and suddenly his whole world is topsy-turvy. He's responsible for a young life, and giving attention to his wife or significant other, and his job. These are demanding, the therapist said with a sigh. Max raised his head. I'm in a custody battle with my, my significant other. I find her sexually breathtaking when I'm pleasing her, but when it's time to engage in my sexual pursuits, I freeze. The therapist wrote some notes and turned to face Max. Mr. Blackstone, you have communicated with me concerning your sexual proclivities in the past, and I have advised you. This is perhaps a more difficult situation to diagnose, because it is cognitive. You may need a psychologist instead of a sex therapist. I can refer you to one if you would like. For now, Mr. Blackstone, you may need some time away from Ms. Bishop and then see what happens. I suggest writing your thoughts in a diary, not every day, but when you are under extreme sexual or mental pressure. Max sucked in a deep breath and exhaled. Thank you. If I find in the future that I can't handle this situation, then I'll ask for a referral. Max shook the therapist's hand and left. As he walked through the glass corridor, his smartphone rang. What is it, Jonas? Max said, irritated. Well, what did that quack say? None of your business. Are you still having problems sleeping? Or is it your girl again? Man, a woman with a body like that, I would fuck her day and night. Shut up, Jonas. You're not making this any easier. She's the mother of my child. Do you hear yourself? What is wrong with you? I've never seen you act nuts behind a woman before. I bet I know why you're at that quack's office. I'm not interested, Jonas. Listen, I will be in Las Vegas this afternoon. Try not to get in any trouble. See you tomorrow in San Francisco. Jonas called Sophia in Las Vegas. Hi, are you busy this afternoon? I have one client, but I can cancel for you. It's not me, darling. It's Max. He may need you. He's all uptight over his woman and child. She's giving him a hard time. He's crazy about her. 
But what can I do? You know what he likes and needs. I don't think he's getting what you specialize in. You know, the bondage and whippings. He's a powerful man, and he has to be in control. When this does not occur, it's because that woman is not being submissive enough. I need you to role play with him. Let him control you and punish you. You know this will cost you, and you owe me, Jonas. Just go to his room. He should be arriving in about an hour. The concierge will let you into his penthouse. I'll call and inform him that you will be there. Jonas called and tried to contact Max to let him know that Sophia would be there to service him, but he didn't get an answer. After the call, Jonas went about being Jonas, spoiled, devious, pretending he was Maximilian Blackstone. Max opened the recliner and lay back. He raised a glass of red wine, took a whiff and looked at it, and then took a large gulp. His Learjet would land in an hour. Feeling lonely, he needed Alex more than he could imagine. He wanted his son, and he wanted Alex. Nothing else mattered in the scheme of things. Not money or power, not even sex. He wanted a family, and they could work the rest out later. There was too much running around in his head for him to concentrate on sex. He surprised himself when he picked up his smartphone to call Alex. Alex, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? I don't know what happened. That never happened before. Alex didn't know how to respond. She was tired of the roller coaster ride she found herself on with Max. First, he left her when she first met him with no explanation, then a brother, then his sexual antics and a dead heiress, and now he could not respond to her sexually. I know what the problem is, Max. Yes, I forgive you. We have been so preoccupied with fighting over our son that we are losing each other. You're a special man who happens to have unusual sexual habits. I can't expect you to change overnight, and that is what you're trying to do to please me. I don't want anyone but you, and I know that I will have to give you what you need. Baby, I'll send a jet for you. Come to me and marry me, will you? I want a family. I want you. When Max called Alex baby, she melted. He sounded vulnerable. It was the first time he had called her that. She would not dwell on whether he had said that before to another woman. Now was not the time. She wanted him any way she could have him. I'll be ready in 15 minutes. And yes, I'll marry you. My son needs a father, and I need you. I'll send a car to meet the jet in Vegas. Don't buy any clothes, we can go shopping. You can buy whatever you desire. You have made me the happiest man in the world. Max arrived at Blackstone Casino Hotel in Las Vegas half an hour early, with no turbulence and no delays because of weather. He was walking on air when he settled into his penthouse suite. He rushed into the shower because he wanted to be ready for Alex. Knowing that his life was about to change, he welcomed the changes. Now he would have a family, his son Alex and her parents. Oh, but what should he do about Jonas? Sophia had arrived early, and prepared herself for a workday. She showered in one of the bedrooms and dressed in knee-high black boots and a short patent leather dress with slits on two sides. Under the dress, she wore nothing but a shaved mound. Hearing the shower, she casually walked out of the room and met Max in his bedroom. What are you doing here, Sophia? Max said, loud with surprise. Why, I heard that you needed my services. I haven't needed you. Since you met Rebecca. I know. You can't be here, Sophia. I'm expecting my fiancé at any time, and we're to be married. 
Congrats, then my services aren't needed. Just wait until I see that brother of yours. I will never need them again. Max threw on a white robe that read Blackstone and hurried Sophia to the elevator door. He grabbed his trench coat and draped it over her shoulders as he reached for his wallet, which lay in a crystal bowl. He placed a wad of hundred-dollar bills in her hand. I hope that's enough. Please go. She looked at Max and replied, Jonas usually takes care of me. The elevator opened on Max, standing with his robe open and a terrified look in his eyes, and Sophia clutching money in her hands. She clicked the black stiletto boots and flashed a smile at Alex. Is this how you plan on spending our honeymoon night? Are you trying to get help so you can fuck me? Is this the kind of life you are going to live with me and my son? Max stood still and could not speak. Sophia didn't know what to do, except walk between the two lovers. I'm sorry, Sophia apologized. I'm just doing my job. She eyed Alex as if to say, now you do yours. Wait, don't go anywhere, you. Alex reached into her purse, and her hand clutched her phone. She took it out, and before Max could say wait, she took a picture of Sophia and him. The judge should be interested in these pictures. Sophia left without Max and Alex noticing, because their eyes were focused on each other. It's not what you think, Alex. I... You planned on getting in a little BDSM, before you married me. I would have to spend my days worrying about why you never wanted to fuck me. Listen to yourself, Alex. That's not you. I don't know who I am anymore. Were you making love to me or Rebecca? Not her again. Max found the nearest chair and fell into it. What do you mean? Are you telling me that you never enjoyed Rebecca sucking your dick and letting you punish her? Why are you talking about yourself in the third person as if you are not that person? I am not that person anymore, and clearly you don't want me unless I'm Rebecca. It is you I want to marry, not Rebecca. You are marrying me because you want my son. I can take our son if I wanted. His eyes were dark and his tone full of arrogance. Now you're admitting that you are planning. Can't you see that that's the only way? The only way you will bend me to your will. I've had enough of you and this crazy fucked up sexual life. I'm going to find a man that I can have a normal relationship with and... He will never get the opportunity to be with you because you are mine, and I don't let anyone or anything come between what I want and what I need," Max said, with a dark hooded expression covering his eyes. Are you threatening me, Max? Max stood, eyes fixed on Alex as if in a trance. His mind wandering, he realized he could not control Alex. He could not have what he needed in life and wanted so badly. Maybe she is too young, he thought. Maybe she needs time to grow up. He didn't want to give her that time, or give her up. She might find that she no longer needed him to make her life complete. Alex didn't wait for an answer. Max gave Alex a hard look, one that made the nape of her neck tremble. One she had never seen before. She wondered what was wrong with him, but she took that opportunity not to find out and rushed to the elevator. Before she could step in, he slid his arm around her waist and another behind her neck. Max's lips touched hers. It was electric. It jolted her. His tongue snaked into her mouth and she began sucking it. Her clit became moist, and he slid his hands on both sides of her black pencil skirt, raising it to her waist. His low moan frightened her. The look on his face was that of a predator. 
He was indeed the wolf that Blake had described in their meeting earlier. No. No. She pushed him away. I can't do this anymore. All we do is fuck, and we never solve anything, and you never answer my questions. Max grabbed Alex's hands and led her to the sofa, overlooking a panoramic view of the Vegas Strip and a mountain range. What do you want to know, Alex? Ask, he demanded. Start with your brother. He lifted himself and paced around and faced the window. Very well. Max exhaled. He took a few moments, trying to fashion a narrative that Alex would understand. Our parents died when we were five, and we inherited millions. I don't know how much. They died in a traffic accident driving to a family meeting, and the last time I remember seeing my mother was when she was in the hospital. My father had died moments before. My mother asked me to take care of Jonas because he was sickly. I have felt burdened by her last wishes all my life because I'm the eldest. He's only a few minutes younger than you. Yes, but he didn't react well to both our parents dying at the same time. I learned that I had to be strong for both of us. I had to be Jonas's mother and father. After our parents were buried, we went to live with our guardians. We were not allowed to handle our money until we reached 21. We were treated well by our wards, but they never showed us love, only that they cared for the money. They had their own children, and we were two boys that were pitied because we had no family. Our uncles, aunts and cousins died in a plane crash on their way to the same family hunting event in Montana. Our entire family had been wiped out in two days, and we were orphans. We inherited large sums of money. Some was for our education, and then our guardians used some of the money for living expenses and to educate their children. We didn't begrudge the use of the money because all we wanted to do was be part of their family, which we never were. We were looked on with contempt by our adoptive parents' children because of our wealth. Jonas felt it the most because he was sensitive. He began running away from home, and each time they returned him, his behavior and attitude became worse. He lived on the street for a while. I spent months looking for him, trying to convince him to come home in hopes that things would be different. As we entered our teens, Jonas was running away every week, until one day he didn't come home, and I received a letter informing me that he had enlisted into the army. He had gone to Afghanistan before I had a chance to talk some sense into him. By then, I could do nothing for him, but pray that he would come home safely. When he did return, after serving three tours while I had been safely tucked away in my private college, he came back with a drug addiction and a mental disorder, what is it called? He snapped his fingers, trying to remember. PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder, Alex added, sitting quietly with her hand to her mouth. He had been so traumatized and on drugs and alcohol that I had to first send him to drug rehabilitation. When he sobered, he had the nightmares so terrible that I had to sleep at his side to prevent him from hurting himself or someone. I couldn't sleep for weeks no matter how I tried. Soon he was able to claim his inheritance and he began spending it on one woman after the next. He spent millions and was soon broke. I had to bankroll him with a business to keep him busy and out of trouble. I gather that business is Pandora's retreat. He's just providing a service. For the seriously fucked up rich, Alex added. What do you want from me, Alex? He's my brother and the only family I have except for our son and for him, I thank you. That business is the only thing that Jonas has excelled at since he was a youth. I love my brother, 
and I made a promise to my mother to watch over him. You can't protect him from himself, Max. You can't be his mother and father and wife. You have a life. Not without you, and it would have to include Jonas. What would you say if I don't want Jonas in my life and around our son? He is seriously messed up. But I can't leave him. Do you understand? Tell me you understand, Alex. All I understand is that I can't be in your world anymore, especially since you have not explained the woman that you were engaged to. I explained that I broke up our engagement when I first met you in Montana. You have said that over and over, and yet it does not explain why you are connected to her death. You will have to trust me. I can't marry you when all you say is, I have to trust you. I have empathy for Jonas, but to tell you the truth, I don't want him around my son. Alex, I'm not going to allow you to prevent our son from forming a bond with his only uncle. Allow. An uncle that has serious mental problems and may be involved in God knows what. He could not do anything to harm another human being. He's too sensitive. He saw death in the army, and who knows what else. And what about you, Max? Could you? If that's how you feel, then maybe we should have some time apart. No. Not some time, forever. It's over, Max. Standing and looking out on the Vegas Strip, Max turned and gazed at Alex. There was a silence, and then he broke it. Alex, I want you to know that I have a court order to take our son. You bastard. She slapped Max across his face. He wasn't surprised, and he didn't move, but when she reached to hit him again, he wrapped his large hand around her wrist, restraining her. Her eyes blazed. You got me here under the pretext of marrying me to tell me that you can take my son whenever you want. That's not true, Alex. It's not what you think. It's exactly what I think. You cannot bend me to your will. It will never happen. I will not sit on my hands while you take my child. How could you do this to me? Tears welled in her eyes. How could you do this, Max? I hate you, Max. I will never love you, never. Max watched as Alex screamed and threw a vase at him. He didn't want that reaction, and clearly something had got out of hand. Their relationship had become toxic. Alex ran for the elevator, and Max didn't stop her.